Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, we were looking at, uh, uh, we began looking at the first chapter of the book, Receiving God's Guidance for Your Life. Okay, we'll, we are on page number um, 11. Okay, we're looking at the different categories of gods. Are there different categories of gods? Will. Okay, we also, I mentioned about this when we were studying fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. Okay, when we, when we saw that God's will is good, pleasing and perfect, we said that there are no different, there are no three categories of God's will, but God's will is good, pleasing and perfect. Okay, so let's look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Can somebody read that, please? Okay, so here we see that some people say that, you know, God's will is three categories. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's pleasing, sometimes it's perfect, but that's not true. God's will at any moment in our life is all good, good pleasing and perfect. Okay, so uh, first we must understand that, you know, uh, uh, you know, his will is good, pleasing and perfect, for example, and it's not three different categories, it's just one a package. Okay, for example, if you take an apple, you know, uh, we don't say the apple, uh, one apple is red, one apple is, uh, you know, flavored, one apple smells very sweet. No, each apple is red. You know, or we have green apples, whatever. If you're taking a red apple, the apple is red. All of the apples are red. Okay, red, flavorful, and sweet smelling. All that is contained in that one apple. Okay, so just in the same way, you know, we can't say that God's will has three different categories. Okay, now the word acceptable, God's will is good, pleasing, and acceptable. The word acceptable does not mean it's permittable. Okay, you're permitted to do anything and everything. Okay, the word acceptable, just like we learned, uh, remember we learned in Ephesians chapter 5, we just looked at Ephesians chapter 5 verse, uh, uh, verse 10, remember that? Uh, we just read it now. Find out what is acceptable to the Lord. Okay, so uh, in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 10 and even in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2, we see that you know, um, uh, it, when you're talking about acceptable, it means fully agreeable or fully or well pleasing to God. We already looked at that, right? Agree. The word acceptable means fully pleasing or well, uh, well pleasing or uh, fully agreeable to uh, God. Okay. So here we see that, you know, uh, God's will is acceptable, which means it's not something that is, uh, you know, permittable. You, you does not mean you can do anything and everything and God will accept it. No, it is the full agreeable, fully agreeable, well-pleasing will of God. Okay. What is agreeing with God and what is pleasing with him and not what is permitted by the world or what we think is permittable or what we can do. Are you able to understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. Uh, so here we see that, you know, there is no three uh, categories of uh, God's will. We also see that Paul does not mention about this in any other epistles. Um, and the other thing is, you know, when we look at the life and teaching of Jesus, you know, uh, we do not find him bringing about these three categories of uh, you know, God's will. You know, how do we know that? Because when, uh, you know, when somebody came to Jesus and they were sick, he did not, what did he do? Did he pray to the Father? He said, did he say, one minute, wait, I will pray to the Father, whether it is his good, pleasing or perfect will to heal you now? What does Jesus do? He just healed them. You know, he says, it, it, the Bible says, the multitudes came and he healed them all. There are many scripture passages in the Bible, in the in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John says, you know, the sick came to him and they healed them all. Okay. So he didn't ask God if it, this is your will to heal this person, then the next person, okay, next in line come. God, is this your will to heal this person? No, because God knows 
uh, Jesus knew that it's God's will to heal everyone. He just went and healed anyone and everyone. But when they came to him in faith, he healed anyone and everyone. Now we can ask about things like, you know, the fall of man when Adam and Eve ate the, uh, you know, uh, fruit and they you know, sinned against God. You know, when the, the, the Hebrew people, Israelite people wanted to eat meat in the wilderness and when the Israelites wanted a king, okay, um, you know, it was all, all of these were against God's will. Yes or no? It was against God's will for Adam and Eve to eat from the fruit. It was against God's will for, um, you know, uh, the Israelites to have a king because God said, I am their king. Okay, if a king comes, they're going to struggle. They're going to suffer. The king is going to overrule them. You know, going to treat them as slaves, going to make them pay taxes. So he says, I am their king. But you know, the people wanted their king. And what did God do? Did he allow Adam and Eve to eat the fruit? Yes or no? Did God allow Adam and Eve to eat the fruit? Yes, he just allowed them to choose their own free will and their own choice. See, he let them do what was their will, what was their choice. Because God has given us the gift of volition. That means a free will to choose. He does not treat us like puppets. Okay, he gives us the free will to choose. But does he lead us and guide us what to choose? Yes, he does. Okay, so, you know, he gives us the freedom to choose. And then, you know, when he... Uh, when we choose something that is not according to his will, but still we see that God works with us. He calls us back to himself, okay? Uh, so to accomplish his purpose and to restore us. For example, you know, um, we know in all of our cities, you know, the law is we cannot murder anybody. Is there any city in the world where they allow murder? No. Okay, this murder does not, is not allowed. So the government does not allow. It's not a permissible law. Okay, but what happens if somebody goes ahead and breaks the law and murders? What happens? Huh? They're punished and the government also works towards correcting them. One way to put them into prison is to correct them and rehabilitate them and help them to see what they have done is wrong. In the same way, you know, God allows us to do whatever we want to choose, but then he comes along and, you know, he's willing to call us back to himself and, uh, you know, he's willing to work in our lives to fulfill his purposes in our uh, lives, okay? So we cannot, you know, think about, you know, God's acceptable will is God's permissible will. We can do anything and everything and we cannot have a casual approach to doing God's will, okay? Um, you know, we need to see everything in the light of his word, what he's asking us to do. And uh, we need to understand that we need to walk in God's good, pleasing and perfect will. Okay. Now we have looked at, uh, you know, God's will, that he's willing to lead us, guide us, that his will is good, pleasing and perfect. And, uh, you know, he's, um, uh, he gives us a wisdom and a spiritual understanding, gives us a knowledge of his will. But there is something that we have to do. Our responsibility. What is our responsibility? The first thing is we need to seek God's will. Okay. We need to seek, which means we need to seek. We also need to listen. We also need to obey. Seek means we need to earnestly desire and ask God to guide us and direct us. Okay. Uh, we need to express our desire to know God's will. You can say, God, I have this plan. I have this stirring in my heart. I have this passion. What is your will? Or you can say, God, this is what I want to do in my life. This is my will. This is my plan. I'm laying it down before you, God. I want you to show me, you know, and I'm willing to obey you. Listen, I'm willing to change. I'm willing to accommodate what you have uh, um, in my life. Okay. So, you know, we need to express our desire to know God's will. And we need to walk in a way that's honoring and pleasing him. When we do that, God reveals his will to us. So you were asking, uh, Vimal, you were asking how we need to know God's will. First thing is you need to seek, okay? And also you need to live a life that is honoring and pleasing uh, to 
him okay uh, so god invites us to seek him god invites us to call upon him and to know his will we read in jeremiah chapter 29 verse 12 and 13 can somebody read that please when will we seek and find god or know his will what does the word of god say when will we seek uh, uh, when will we know god's will when we pray when we call upon him when we seek him you know what is the meaning of seek when you when you lose something precious a gold chain a gold earring you just don't look here and there, ah, I can't find it, it's okay. But you will look at every nook and corner, you remove everything, you, you, know, you know, change everything, remove the furniture, search, that is seeking till you find it, okay? So, you know, you need to uh, seek, you know, and it says here, when you search for me with all your heart, thank you, Nina, it says when you search for him or seek with, with all your heart, heart it's not just a mental thing oh i need to see god ma'am told me that okay let me just see god what is your will in my life please make it known to me but you know you are deep down in your heart there's a thirst there's a desire there's a longing okay you must seek god with wholeheartedness uh, and god rep uh, you know when we seek god with a whole heart god responds to such heart attitudes can somebody read jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3 please Yes. So here, you know, we must seek him with a whole heart. And when we do that, he will show us great and mighty things which we do not know. Okay. So if you want to know greater, deeper revelations of God's word, this truth, how to flow in the gifts of the spirit, what do you need to do? You need to seek God with all your heart, desire it. Okay. And when you're seeking God, you know, when you seek him, you know, you will find things. Okay, as we earnestly inquire of God, we will know his will, we will know his direction in our lives, we will come to receive uh, guidance and his leading in our life. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 is a very famous, uh, a very familiar uh, passage of scripture. Can somebody read that? Yes. So sometimes, you know, what we do, we just sit back and think God knows our need. He has to provide. Yes, God knows, you know, he'll provide. But, you know, we need to ask. It says all those who ask will receive. All those who seek will find. You know, even in seeking things about God, knowing about God, and all those who um, knock, the door will be opened. Okay. So for our seeking and receiving God's guidance, you know, it takes on different expressions. The first one is seeking uh, his guidance during the normal course of things. You know, sometimes only when we have to make big decisions in life, we go to God. But when we go to God for simple things, you know, simple things like even if you're going to buy a shoe or, a you know, a, a T-shirt or you know which color you're very good at choosing, you know, uh, all of that, which shop, everything. But, you know, even in those things, you can say, God, lead me to the right shop. I've always been going to this shop. Help me to choose the right shirt. Help me to choose the right color. See, uh, you know, my father, every time he goes out to buy anything, whether it's meat or vegetables or, you know, groceries, or uh, he has to go and buy any equipment or uh, for the home, or is they're going shopping, you know, to buy some clothes, anything, every time he'll be in the prayer room praying, asking God for wisdom to take the right shop to buy the right thing. You know, I've seen him do that every single day. My mother says, go buy tomato. He'll be in the prayer room praying and then and he's going to buy the tomatoes, you know. So for every little thing, it's total depend dependence on God. So my his older brother used to make fun of my dad saying, you know, he's like this um, prisoners. You know, when they come out of jail, every one hour they have to go and report to the police station. Like that, your dad, will every moment he will be going and asking God. But it is total dependence of God. So when we are depending on God on simple things in life, no, you know, when it comes to bigger things, we can re easily with clarity uh, hear God, sense God, uh, and uh, you know, know what he is leading us and 
uh, guiding us. So even the small things of life, even when you're writing assignment, God, how do I write this assignment? You know, God, when you know I'm choosing this, what do I choose? You know, simple things we can just uh, pray and ask God. Seek His guidance. Seek His guidance even during the special times of your life. You know, big decisions that you're making. Um, you know, during those times, you know, whether which job, which career to take, whether you have to go from move from one city to another city, which you know who to marry, and all of those. Whether to get into ministry, which ministry. Just you know, spend time seeking God. Just spend time praying. You know, days on end, uh, worshiping God. Um, just waiting upon him you know uh, isaiah 58 uh, says talk uh, 58 verse 8 talks about the chosen fast uh, in in his light breaking forth in our lives chosen fast means sometimes you know even fasting it says when we choose to fast what does it it brings about it brings about god's light in our life okay and we know god uh, you know is a lamp to my feet and a light to our path that means he guides us Okay, he will show us which part to uh, take. He will guide us continually. Isaiah 58 verse 11, you know, God's guidance does not just come once or twice in our life. It comes continually. Can somebody read Isaiah chapter 58 verse 11, please? Yes, so here, you know, we need to, uh, God continually guides us. And the third thing is, you know, there are sometimes there are God moments when God will just speak to us from somebody, some counsel, some preacher. When we're praying, God will just put something in our heart. It's like when you're reading God's word, a Rima word will just come and we will just receive God's guidance. Okay, so the first thing we need to do for receiving God's will is to seek God's will. Second thing is to listen okay um and it talks about uh john chapter 10 where you know the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd and when the sheep tells them shepherd tells them to come the sheep will follow him okay so they the sheep follow the voice that they know and they recognize they will not follow a voice of a stranger so they are able to follow the shepherd because they know and listen to his voice and the sheep do not follow strangers because they do not recognize the voice of the stranger the same way who is our sh uh, shepherd jesus okay we need to tune ourselves to and recognize his voice and his leading because he leads us and guides us and the sh and those who recognize his voice are the sheep who will walk in the way that he is uh, showing them okay so we need to listen and tune ourselves to listen to God's voice, to recognize and to know, uh, you know, um, what God is leading us, what he's asking us to do. Okay, Psalms chapter 23, verse 3 and 4. Can somebody read that, please? Yes. So, you know, you've seen the shepherd always having a stick, okay, the staff or the rod. What is he, what does he use the staff and rod for? Okay, to guide them. And then there's one sheep that is going astray, then he will just tap it and it will come in line and just, you know, keep them in line. Sometimes also if the sheep is going astray, he will just you know, put the, you know, that hook around that staff and just put it on the neck and slowly, gently lead the uh, things, uh, uh, the sheep, okay? So it's not only for uh, uh, serving as a defense or protecting the sheep or guiding them, uh, but, you know, it's also, you know, the, the sheep, the shepherd also leads the sheep from the front. Sometimes you see the shepherd leading from the front and the sheep will follow because they know that path is very familiar. Okay, they can just easily follow. But when there is unfamiliar, uh, when it's, um, you know, they just follow the sheep because they, you know, the shepherd, because they know his voice. And there are times when, you know, uh, 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 the shepherd would take, a, you know, go back, you know, walk behind them when it's a familiar path, you know, and will allow the sheep to walk in front because the sheep knows they're used to this way, you know, so they, 
they they will go at the back uh, i mean they walk ahead and the shepherd walks behind and the shepherd is able to see if all the sheep are in line but it's sometimes when it's an unfamiliar place the shepherd will walk in the front and the sheep will just follow and he will just make his you know keep making those voices talking to his sheep and they will just uh, follow through okay so the shepherd's voice his rod, his staff are different pictures of God's guidance in our lives. Okay, we are a sheep and God wants to keep us on the right path. He wants to guide us and he wants to lead us. But we need to be willing to listen to the shepherd. Okay, and we need to be willing to follow. The last thing is obeying the, uh, you know, obeying our uh, the king or our shepherd. Okay, so God guides us when He God's, when God guides us, we need to be obedient to listen. And sometimes it is even laying down our own will, our own plans, our own purposes, what we are comfortable doing, what we like doing, what we think is best for us. We need to lay it down just to obey what God is telling us to do. Can somebody read? Um, somebody else can read uh, Proverbs three thirty two. Admonition. Yeah. So here we see that who does God give his secret counsel to? To the upright. Yes. Why the upright? Because they are the ones who are willing to obey God. They are willing to do, seek his will. They are willing to listen to his will. They are willing, they are living a righteous, holy life that is honoring God. And they are doing things that is right in the, the eyes of God. And they are walking pleasing to him, doing things that is pleasing to him, fully acceptable, agreeable to God. And that is the person God is going to give counsel to. Okay. So if you're not receiving God's counsel in your life, you need to look at you know what you're doing wrong. Are you living a life that is holy, pleasing, upright in God's sight? Are you seeking God's will? You know, uh, seeking it with all your heart, not just one time prayer. And also, are you willing to listen to what God is asking you to do? Okay. So there are times when God leads us and guides us. You know, we need to obey with, uh, with we need to trust him. Uh, we need to, you know, sometimes, you know, don't use our logical reasoning, but just go in faith and obedience, uh, obey him and uh, be patient with what God is revealing to us because he sometimes does not show us the entire way. He will just give us step from one step to the next step so we need to be patient but when we are patient and willing to obey god will guide us and everything will go well in our lives okay so that is chapter one anyone has any questions any questions no questions anyone from our online students have any questions Okay, if there are no questions, we look at the chapter 2. David inquires of the Lord. Or how did David inquire of the law of God? Okay. We know that uh, what does God call David as? A man after his own heart. Okay. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Uh, one who is willing to do, uh, God says, one who will do all my will. So, you know, why was David a man after God's own heart? Why did God say he's a man after my own, uh, my own heart? Or why does God says he's a man who will do, you know, all my will? Okay, let's study David's life and then uh, we will know that. Okay, so we see that God says with such confidence that David is a man after his own heart, God's own heart. And he's a man who will do all that God wills and you know even as we study this we need to come to that place where you know we are saying god i want to come to that place where you are able to look at my life and say you know this person you know uh, whether it's rin or uh, sri radha or, or francis or nina or um, vimal you know uh, charan we have charan right chirag chirag 
you know, uh, you know, just um, uh, you know, uh, somebody who is um, a man or a woman after my own heart, and somebody who is going to do uh, the, you know, is willing to do my will, okay, not their will. So let's look at, um, you know, Acts chapter thirteen, verse thirty-six. Uh, as Paul was preaching, what he said about David. Okay, can somebody else read who's not read so far? Yeah, so here it says, you know, he was somebody who served his own generation. How? By the will of God. Okay, so you, we, you and I need to serve God in our generation by doing the will of God. Okay, that means he followed God's purposes for his life. He fulfilled God's assignment for his life. Doing God's will means he was somebody who followed God's purposes and fulfilled God's assignment for his life. And we see that David, at different points in his life, you know, he inquires of God. That means he asks God, What do I do in this um, situation? We know that David was somebody who was, you know, who played the harp very well. He was very skillful in playing the harp. He was also very courageous when taking care of the sheep. He killed the lion and the bear he was also very prudent that means he was very very uh he you know he when he acted he acted showing care and uh, you know giving thought to the future prudent person is that somebody who acts with care and gives thought to the future and we also know he was very handsome and uh, good looking and uh, samuel uh, the prophet anointed him as the next king of Israel. Okay, so when David uh, killed Goliath, it says in First uh, Samuel chapter eighteen, verses five, uh, verse seven, verse twelve, verses fourteen to sixteen and thirty, it says David behaved wisely. Okay, David behaved wisely, was highly favored and regarded in Israel. Okay, and the people knew that the Lord was with him. And there's several places where it says, you know, David behaved wisely. So, you know, when why does the Bible mention this? Because, you know, God wants us to behave wisely, not foolishly. Okay. Uh, he's, where he's very pleased when we behave wisely. Okay. And we see that, you know, after David killed Goliath, you know, Saul was all out to kill David. And David was running for his life he was like a vagabond just running here and there you know living in caves for many uh, many years and but god you know gave him a, a, a very group a group of 400 men who were very faithful to uh, david okay they were his soldiers they were like his army very faithful people and we see that later on these people when david became the king went on to be leaders in his kingdom and in his um, army and so we see here you know these uh, 400 people these 400 men they came to david when he was living in the wilderness in the forest in the caves the mountains they came and they wanted him to be his leader and they stayed along with him so david was a leader and we see that david made any decision that he made he actually inquired of god okay before he took any step he asked god you know what was uh, what to do and i think this was a practice for david from a very young age from a very young age he kept inquiring of uh, god okay so there are many incidents that we will look at and there were many more that is not recorded but we know that david was somebody who kept inquiring of the lord and he was one who was doing god's will okay first samuel chapter 23 verses 1 to 5 you know, David is told that the Philistines, you know, the Philistines were constantly coming to fight against the Israelites. They told that, you know, the Philistines were coming to fight against Kilia, a place called Kilia, and, you know, they were robbing their threshing floors. That means, you know, the Philistines, what they used to do during the time of judges, during the harvest time, when the harvest was ready, the Philistines would come, you know, and the people had harvested their grain and the rice and the barley and whatever they grown, olives, they would come and take off all the harvest and they would just plunder the people of israel and then you know the people would cry out to god and god would raise up a judge who would fight against the philistines so here we see they came to the threshing floors you know just threshing floors where they thresh wheat you know make it uh atta, the flour or thresh uh, olives to make it oil thresh the grapes to make it um, wine 
they came and took away everything that you know the Israelites had worked hard for. And what did David do? You know, it says David inquired of the Lord and he says, God, can I go and attack the Philistines? And what does God say? Go and attack the Philistines. And when David comes and tells his men, you know, we're going to attack the Philistines, whether his men um, happy to do it. No, they were very scared. They said, oh, the Philistines, how can we go and fight against them? We are just a small group of 400 people. You know, we are no match to them. And so then David goes again and inquires of the Lord. And God tells him, you know, um, arise, go down to Kelia, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. For Samuel chapter 23, verse 4. And then David takes his men and they go and God gives them a mighty victory. And uh, they take away all the livestock, plunder the, uh, the, the, the Philistines. And then we see that, you know, this was a kind of a confidence booster for the, his men, his 400 men. Because they knew that, you know, when David inquires the Lord, whatever God is telling him to do, David is doing it. And our leader is somebody who's inquiring of the Lord. And that is why we are having victory. We're seeing um, success. So also, you know, when we... Um, we are working as a team. You know, you are a leader of a team or you're the, you know, as a husband, you're the head of the family, you know, uh, or you're the head of the home. Uh, you are a leader in the church, you're a pastor or you oversee some churches. You have to make some decisions, you know. You can ask the Lord. He will give you the guidance. And sometimes when you come and present it to people, they will not be convinced. So you can go back and ask God. Okay, God, is this really one, what you want me to do? And, you know, um, even if people are not convinced and you know for sure that this is what God wants you to do, you can go and ahead and do it. And when God, when God, God in his time will show them, okay, with the success he's giving you in that project or what venture you've taken, what God has asked you to do, when, you know, when uh, you do it, you know, your teammates will see the success and they know, yes, God is with this person. Okay, they, she, she or he is doing what God has asked them to uh, do. Okay, I remember once, you know, um, God told me to do something um, and um, when I was in the children's ministry and I shared it with the children, they were ready and they readily bought it. They were excited. They just flowed in it. But uh, the team was not willing to, some of the team was not willing to give in. So there was only two or three people in the team who were supporting this whole idea. And we just went about doing it because we were, I was 100% sure this was from God. And in the end result, God showed me what he wants me to do through this whole activity or through this whole project that he brought about in, in those couple of months. In the end, he showed me what is going to happen. And in the end, you know, when, um, when God did it, he did something so profound, so powerful um, that everyone saw it and they knew that it was not my idea, it was god's idea because god got all the glory because it, it was very evident we were no nothing we, we couldn't do anything but the way the children did things it was so uh so, so powerful they could just sense the see you can sense the anointing and the presence of god and from just you know somebody just enacting or doing a show it was such a powerful presence of the lord and people knew that it was so god will show people in your team at the right time that this is what is from him and you know when he gives the success for what you have to do okay then another thing we uh, see when we face setbacks in life when we face disappointments in life when we face hopelessness in life what do we do we can learn from david first samuel chapter 30 verses 1 to 8 now you know um uh, david and his men had gone away and they come back to where you know they were living they were living in, in a place called ziklag and they came back and they found that, you know, their whole, their tents and everything was burnt up. Everything was, their animals, everything was plundered. And all of their wives and children were taken and carried away. And what happens? The people and David's heart was so broken. They were so sad because they lost everything. Their wives and children were taken away. They start crying. They start weeping and they start mourning. You know, and we see that, um, you know, the, the, the 400 men were so angry with uh, David. Now they had become from 400 to 600 men. The 600 men were very angry with David. They were planning to stone him. See? And just imagine David's position. 
he has to handle the 600 men he is a leader so he is wondering who's taken his wife uh, he's not only uh, you know his men have not only lost their wife and children he's lost their his wives and his children and everything and but what does it say very beautifully here it says in verse 6 but david strengthened himself in the lord his god how did he strengthen himself he must have sang to god weeping and mourning with his broken heart you know, he would have played on his harp, just sang, worshipped God. He would have just prayed to God. He would have just poured out his love to God. He strengthened himself in the Lord. And then David, you know, uh, asked uh, the thing, you know, to bring the ephod. Ephod was a way that people in, in the Old Testament times used to know God's will, what to do, whether it's a yes or no, whether they should go ahead in the battle and fight yes or no okay so he says bring the ephod and then he inquires of the lord and he asks god god shall i pursue these people who have come and destroyed and taken our women and children as as uh, uh, slaves shall i overtake them and what's this god answer pursue for you shall surely overtake them without fail and you can recover everything so you know um, David takes the 600 men, he pursues those uh, enemy who has come and destroyed everything and taken their wives and children. They, they pursue them and they recover everything. Okay, So his men would have also learned a lesson here again that you know David is inquiring of the Lord and whenever he requires, inquires of the Lord, God gives him success. Okay, So there is a powerful lesson that we can learn when we face setbacks in life, disappointments, hopeless situations, you know, uh, which puts us down in like a pit or, you know, puts us in a corner where nothing we can do in life. There doesn't seem any possibilities, you know, um, or we're just pushed against the wall. There's, there's no way we can do anything. You know, we can do what David did. The first thing what David did was strengthen himself in the Lord. Pray, worship, you know, pour out your love to God. The second thing is ask God for his guidance and direction on how you must handle the situation and what action you must take. Okay. And another situation was, you know, when there is a transition in your life and you're moving from one thing to another, maybe from school to college or from college to doing your, uh, you know, uh, studying whatever you want to do as your career or you finish your studies, you want to go for your job and for your job, you know, you want to get married, you want to have a family. When having all these, you know, this transition in life, you know, what happens? So let's look at an example in um, David's life. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to uh, 4. You know, now King Saul is dead. So David receives the news that King Saul is dead. And uh, so, you know, David knows it's the right time for him to go and become the king because he's already anointed as king. Okay. So what does David do? He does not say, hey, man, I'm already anointed as king. Prophet Samuel told me I'm already king. God is already, you know, assured that. So let me go to the city and let me tell everybody I'm already anointed as king by Prophet Samuel. You know, you have to accept me as king. He does not take, you know, uh, you know, he does not do what is the permittable will for God, of God. But what does he do here? He inquires of God. You know, he asks God, God, can I go up to any of the cities of, shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And God says, go up. And then David says, which city should I go? And God says, go to Hebron. Okay, so he goes to Hebron. When he goes to Hebron, people of the tribe of Judah accept him as king. And then he's there as king for seven and a half uh, years. And after seven and a half years, we see that the people of Israel, they come to him and they ask him to be king over entire Israel. Okay, so this is an important lesson that we can learn to receive uh, guidance when we are, uh, you know, when we are moving on in life, when we are journeying through life, when we are making transitions. You know, God, uh, God, we are un when we, are, you know, we when we listen to God's will, when we obey God's will, we are under His guidance. He will position us and take us closer to fulfilling his plan and purpose for our life. So David inquired of God. God fulfilled his plan and purpose, made him as king over Judah. And then, you know, after seven and a half years, he became the king over Israel as well. Okay. So when we face our enemy, who is our enemy? 
Satan. Okay, what do we do? What is this? What is the will of God? What is the strategies that we uh, uh, use? Okay, so let's look at an example from Second Samuel chapter five, verses seventeen to twenty-five, uh, uh, looking at again David's life. Okay. Now we see that you know the Philistines um, heard that David was anointed as king, and David had actually captured a fortress called Zion. Okay, and he he built the city of David around it. So he built a city, made himself very strong, a fortified city. He was very strong, and when the Philistines heard about it, you know they marched against. David. They came to the valley of uh, Rephaim, okay. And when they came there and they were ready to fight against David, what does David do? David inquires of the Lord. You know, David says, "God, shall I go up against the Philistines?" He does not say, "Okay, you know, the Philistines have come to battle. It's obvious I have to go and fight against them. I can't be sitting in my palace." So there's no point in inquiring of God. See, but what do he? What does he do? And he's already had, you know, he's had prior experiences where he has won the battle against the Philistines. Okay, he could have said, "Okay, I'm, I, I can win this time." But he still inquires of the Lord. He inquires of the Lord and says, "Shall I go up against the Philistines?" It's like a stupid question, you know, like a child asking the when the mother's kept the food on the table, should I eat this food? You know, when the army comes against you, you need to fight. Okay, but he says, "Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands?" And what does the Lord say? Go up, because you can, without any doubt, you will deliver the Philistines into your hands. So we see that David goes, marches against the Philistines, and what happens? David is defeated. No. He wins the battle. He defeats them, and he says, "Is no God has brought a breakthrough." Okay, God has brought a breakthrough, like you know, water breaking uh, through. Okay, so God has brought a, a breakthrough. Okay, and then we see that um, you know the David and his men carry everything, whatever they have uh, plundered, and again the Philistines come to fight against. David, okay. The Philistines come to fight against David, and this time, what does he do? He does not fall back on the previous will of God, okay. The permissive, permissive will of God does not say, okay, God permitted me last time. This time again, they've come to the same place. It's obvious that I have to go and fight against them. But what does David do? Again, he inquires of the Lord, and what does God do this time? He gives him a different. Strategy, he says, you shall not go up, but circle around behind them, and come upon them in the front of the mulberry trees. And he says, when you hear the sound of marching of the troops in the mulberry trees, you shall advance quickly, for then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. So, how can people be marching on top of the mulberry trees? Can anyone be marching on top of a tree? So what is it talking about? It's talking about the heavenly angelic hosts that are going to come and fight this battle for David. The previous battle was easy. Okay, so God said, "You can go and fight. I will surely give you." But here He's saying that you know God is saying, you know He is actually having a the angelic hosts, okay, to come and. Um, uh, you know, to fight against the heavenly armies is going to come and fight. That's why he's saying, when you hear the sound of marching on the tops of the mulberry trees, a lot of mulberry trees, when you hear the sound of marching, how can people march on top of trees? Nobody can march. So he's talking about the heavenly armies that are going to come, and they're going to make the noise of marching. And then he says, when you hear that, then only you should advance to fight. Okay, so we see that you know uh, David was this time backed up by the heavenly armies. What do you think if David would have not inquired of the Lord and he would have gone to fight the Philistines? Would he have won or lost the battle? 
you would have lost because this time it, they would have come more powerfully they would have come with a lot of things and so that is why god is sending the heavenly armies okay so there's an important lesson for us to learn here yes god has given us the authority and he has given us the victory over satan on the cross jesus defeated our enemy he defeated satan he's given us he shares the victory with us he's also given us the weapons we need for our warfare ephesians you know the the, the armor of god okay he's given us everything we need to uh, place uh, to fight against our enemy and our enemy is where where is your enemy underneath your feet where is your enemy underneath your feet not because you have the authority not because you're powerful because jesus won the enemy on the cross he's already defeated but sometimes we think the enemy is above us we are ab afraid of him right but he's underneath our feet so you know uh, god has given us all the authority all the weapons that we need to overcome our battle against the enemy but sometimes when the enemy comes in very forcefully okay uh, we need to resist him we need to nullify him but also you know we need to also ask god god what do i do show me okay and uh, god will give us the strategies at that time of course he's given us every weapon but he give us the strategies we need to stand firm and we need to walk in the dominion over the defeated foes okay so uh, when things are going wrong for no apparent reasons okay uh, you sometimes you find in your life that things are going wrong and you're not able to find why so one sickness after the other sickness one problem after the other problem it never seems to end you're wondering why and we look and learn from david's life david in we read in second samuel chapter 21 verse 1 there was a famine for how many years there was a famine 3 years and david must be wondering how can there be a famine in god's land among god's people god's chosen people so you know god uh, david inquires of the lord lord why is this famine why is it happening what does god say it's because of the sins of saul because he killed the gibeonites okay um the gibeonites had basically you know um uh, had helped the israelites and uh you know uh, the israel israelites had promised to protect the Gibeonites, but we see uh, King Saul attack the Gibeonites, and so God was very angry, and God was punishing them for their sins. And what does David do? He just does not take you know, listen to God and say, "Oh, this is what happened with King Saul. There's nothing I can do." What does he do? You know, he repents. He asks God for forgiveness. He restores things with the people of Gibeon, and what happens? The famine stops so sometimes when you see in your family there's poverty people are dying very young there's sickness one after the other there's one after the other accidents happening mishaps happening now don't take it as just a thing that is happening generally or there is some curse because once you're in christ jesus no curse holds but there can be some sin that is hindering okay and then you can go to the lord and ask in prayer and you can check i also did that once you know there was something that's happening in our family you know extended all my dad's my dad's side all of his brothers all of my cousins I was wondering why once i went into uh, the prayer room and just seeking god and praying and you know god is showing me all the different situations uh, in my family's life in my father's side my brother my dad's brothers my dad all the things that he did and I was just weeping and moaning and crying so loudly as if somebody is dead in my house because you know, the sin was so great and God is showing me the sin and you know I was just standing in the gap and repenting and asking forgiveness and after that we did see uh, breakthroughs okay so it's important for us to ask God what is the reason listen to God you know what he's telling us uh, receive his counsel and then we can take action and when we take the action you know we can change so today we just basically saw you know different ways of inquiring of the lord you know uh, why was david called a man after god's own heart because david did the will of god with all his heart he sought god he received god's guidance throughout every season in his 
life. Okay, so David could have received it by a dream, visions to the Holy Spirit, to the Urim, the Turim, to the prophets. Uh, but whatever you know, he just received God's guidance, and uh, he was able to, you know, go ahead in life. And that's why he was known as a man after God's own heart, and he was able to do God's will in every area of his life. Okay. We'll end class here. If you have any questions, we will take it up um, uh, when we begin uh, next class. Okay. So anyone has any questions, we can take it up. Um, uh, especially online students, you can hold on to your questions and you can type it out. And next week when we begin class, we can start off that. But some of you in the in-person classes, uh, in-person students, you know, after my third class with the third years, I'm free then. I can answer your question. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining class. Um, have a blessed weekend. I'll see you next week. Thank you.